Hello and welcome again to our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. You'll remember the last study that we had together, we began to look at the, at the city of Corinth, a city to which Paul went immediately after he'd been to Athens. And there's some surprise, at least to me, that he had such a poor reception among those philosophers in, in Athens and such great success in such a wicked city like Corinth, at least as a human being, it, it seems that way. But as Paul goes forward in this book of uh, 1 Corinthians, we're going to discover that human wisdom is not what matters. And so worldly people may be more receptive, oddly enough, to the truth than deep thinkers, uh, like these philosophers who, who love to hear the sound of their own voice, so to speak. And I'm not impugning all philosophers, just that kind of philosopher. We observed that in Acts chapter 18, Paul went to the city of Corinth. We saw that he first went to the synagogue after he had established a, a relationship uh, in tent making with Aquila and Priscilla, Jews who had been expelled from Rome by Claudius Caesar. Uh, so he began to preach in the synagogue. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't always go very well. In fact, it didn't last very long at all. Uh, because some within the synagogue were almost enraged at Paul. They began to blaspheme or speak against the name of Jesus. And when they did, Paul said, well, I'm, I'm going to the Gentiles then, uh, which he did. He worked out of uh, a house there. Uh, <clears throat> and, and in working out of that house, he was able to teach a number of people, uh, converting uh, one, one of the men that you would least expect, Crispus, ruler of the synagogue, obeyed the gospel, and uh, his whole family, and others as well. Uh, God, or Jesus, urges Paul to stay. He promises to keep him safe. Paul stays for about a year and a half, does a great work in the city of Corinth. Then he moves on. But now this, in this letter that he writes to this church, which obviously would be one of his great loves of his life, uh, because they were his children in the faith. He'll talk about that. Uh, he begins to write the letter, and in typical fashion of that era, he starts with his own name. Have you ever read a letter where you, where you began to read and thought, who in the world wrote this letter to me? And you had to turn over to the end and see, sincerely, you know, so-and-so, whoever it might be. They solved that problem. They start off with, this letter's from Paul. Paul. Call to be an apostle, not by man's will, but by God's will. Again, that will be very significant as we go on in our study. And then he's writing to these recipients. Here's the author. Here are the recipients, the church of God. And he began to describe that church as we closed out our study. We want to pick up with that in just a moment. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright and sun, heart of my heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. So, the first Corinthian epistle begins this way. Let's remember, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So, we've, we're talking about the church of God at Corinth, and Paul actually elaborates on what it means to be the church of God, particularly zeroing in on uh, the various members and the characteristics of those members in a spiritual sense of the word. And so, he says... A call to be saints. Of course, he says um, those who are sanctified, we would say set apart. Uh, set apart from what, we might say? Well, set apart from the world. Uh, 
And when you think about Corinth, I mean, that, that's just perfect. You know, when we say set apart, uh, talking about Corinth, you're talking about a very, very wicked city. But these Christians are set apart. They're set apart from uh, the world around them. All of that wickedness uh, that we have seen before. Then he goes on and he says, called to be saints. The idea behind uh, the word saints is the, our word holy. They're called to be holy. Now, you might ask the question, how are they called? And the answer uh, comes in another epistle that Paul wrote in the book of 2 Thessalonians, uh, chapter 2, uh, beginning of verse 13, where he says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief, in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are called by the gospel. Later, chapter 15, Paul is going to remind them of what he preached when he was among them. And guess what it was? The gospel. How that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So there it is. Paul preached the gospel to them. And that is a calling to be made holy, to become saints. Saints are not people physically dead. Instead, saints are people who spiritually have died to selfishness and now are alive to Christ. And that's the description that Paul uses. With all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Call on the name. Very important. Name of who? Well, he's very specific about that. The name of uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, those two words are very important in the New Testament. Jesus basically means Savior. Uh, Christ is anointed. Uh, we might use a different word there. We might say king because he certainly was anointed to be king over the kingdom, which is his church. And so there is Paul's description. Uh, and he says, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that would be our master. And he says both theirs and ours. And uh, in other words, he's Lord of all people who are members of the church. Very, very important that he would open up that way. So then he goes immediately from introducing himself, talking about the people to whom he is writing, and now he goes forward and gives a special greeting. Paul is interesting in the greeting that he gives, and the, the thing that I find significant about it is that he combines two greetings of the day. Listen to him in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 1. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, charis, it was the Greek greeting of the day. And then, and peace. Peace was the Hebrew greeting. And uh, we might note that it's still the Hebrew greeting. If you go to Israel today, it would not be uncommon for someone to greet you with shalom. And of course, when you leave them, shalom, and it means peace, peace. So we, they come in peace and you go in peace. And that's, that is the way that the Jews spoke to one another. For the Christian, these two greetings, one Greek and the other uh, Jewish, uh, proved to be a wonderful thing to meld, to put together. The grace of God is what actually sets us apart to be holy. And so he extends, Paul extends the idea of that grace to them. He wants them to constantly remember that God gave a gift to them and to all people that they didn't really deserve. He gave it to them because he loved them. He loves us as well. And then peace that peace 
uh, is a peace that passes human understanding. You really cannot explain that peace to those who have never known it. Uh, Those in sin can be and often are burdened with a sense of guilt, with the weight of their own guiltiness, if you would. But, but we have the opportunity for peace. It's a peace spoken of by, by the Apostle Paul uh, when he writes to the Philippian Christians. And he explains to them uh, in beautiful terminology uh, exactly how they ought to pray. And uh, he says, In nothing be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That is exactly what Paul is calling uh, for as a blessing for these people. It's his greeting for them. Uh, That quote, of course, came from Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 6 and 7. Here, he just says to them, grace, God's unmerited favor, And peace, that peace that nobody really understands because you've been freed from your sins. You can give thanks that you are not what you were, but you are now something very special because of and through the working of Jesus Christ, especially on the cross of Calvary. So that is Paul's greeting to them. Then he launches immediately into uh, the book, the, the letter. And he begins to to make special comments about them. Almost every letter that Paul wrote includes at the beginning some thankfulness or some some good things that he observes uh, either in the person to whom he is writing or uh, particularly the churches to whom he is writing. The exception would seem to be the book of Galatians. There's a lot wrong going on there and Paul tackles that instantly and does not really pause uh, to spend much time with listing their good qualities. Those do come up a little bit through the book, but not nearly as much as they do in a place like this. So verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 1, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Uh, in, In our language it says, I thank my God always concerning you. Uh, We might say it slightly differently. It doesn't have a a whole lot of difference in meaning, but but yet it may drive something home for you. It does for me. Instead of concerning, what about because of? I thank God because of you. Because you received the grace of God. Because that grace has set you free from the bondage of sin. Paul loved what he saw that had happened at Corinth. And he says, I'm thanking God all the time uh, because uh, of that grace that you received. That you were enriched in everything by Him, in all utterance and all knowledge. Enriched in everything, we might say in every respect. There's not a single way in which this church was not made more rich. Now, given that the false teachers are going to come along and they're going to say, in fact, they're already saying, as Paul writes this letter, that uh, you you people are behind. You've you've obeyed uh, at the preaching of a man who's less than than a real apostle. He's really not that significant. He doesn't look good when you look at him and he sure doesn't speak well. And Paul says, wait a minute, you're enriched in every respect. And he's going to drive that home uh, for for all of us. So now we're we're seeing him begin to praise this church. Verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Why is it that they are enriched in every respect? The answer is because they're the testimony of Christ. What Paul told them about Christ was confirmed in them. They they followed through. They obeyed the gospel. Paul underscores that. So that you come short in no gift, 
eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted them to know, you're not behind anybody. I don't care what the false teachers are saying to you, Paul would say. You are equal to any church anywhere in the entirety of our great brotherhood. And he wanted them to know that. And he explains it uh, saying that I, I don't want you to be short in any gift, any blessing. He's going to talk both about the miraculous gifts in this book, chapters 12, 13, and 14. And he then later will talk about the gifts of God like, like the monetary blessings uh, that they receive. That's brought up in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So they're not going to fall short in any gift, he says. Uh, and furthermore, they're eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the idea is eager but patient. That's a hard blend. I don't know if when you were a child, if you ever knew that grandma and grandpa were coming and that you got so excited and just couldn't wait until they got there. That's the childish way. Paul describes them, this church at, at Corinth, as, as being eager for the Lord to come back, but, but they're patient. They're waiting. It's going to be fine. And they're waiting for, of course, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He once again will be made known to the world. And that's described, of course, by the two men in white apparel, Acts chapter 1. It's described by John in Revelation chapter 1, where he indicates that everybody's going to see him, even those who pierced him will see him. So these Christians are eagerly but patiently watching for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the revelation of Jesus from heaven. Verse 8, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word end there, in some ways you might say, uh, refers to the, uh, the end of time, but Paul is really saying to completion. Uh, he, he wants them to be confirmed, to remain faithful, to be true all the way to the completion of their lives. And for good reason. Because therein lies the blessings that they're going to want to receive and that we all want to receive. Uh, God is faithful, Paul says, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. Faithful. That is, God will carry out His promises. They had obeyed the gospel. If I understand from the remainder of Paul's writings and his preaching in the book of Acts, they obeyed the gospel believing they would be set free from their sins on the basis of the promise of God. A promise that Jesus alluded to. For example, Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. So Paul just says, God's faithful. Uh, you, you've been set free from your sins. He lives up to His promise. Uh, and you were, you were called by Him, remember how? By the gospel, we've already seen that. Called by Him into the fellowship of His Son. Fellowship means a partnership, a sharing. Can you even... Imagine that. I know I struggle with it. But just think about it a minute. Imagine starting a new business and having the sign that identifies the business, you know, over the business and it says, Jesus Christ and, and then you supply your name, Jesus Christ and Gary. Boy, you know, that's a business sure to succeed, not because of Gary, but because of that first name, Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that in the gospel, we're called into a partnership with, guess who? Jesus Christ. We're called there by God. It is a wonderful, wonderful thought. Now, before we leave these opening nine verses, what I want us to do is to go back, just briefly, 
And we're just going to highlight a little part of several verses. Notice verse 1, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, Christ Jesus. And then a little later in the verse, Jesus Christ. Verse 3, Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 4, Christ Jesus. Verse 6, Christ. Verse 7, Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, Jesus Christ our Lord. In nine verses, nine times, Paul has talked about Christ. Often it's Jesus Christ, Savior, King. But over and over and over again, nine times, he talks about Christ. That's important because of the next verse. Listen. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He's brought up Jesus Christ, or Christ in particular, nine times. Now, in the 10th verse, he pleads with them on the basis of the authority of that name, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why should you do this? Because as a Christian, you have made Jesus Christ the Lord, the Master of your life. And it ought to impact your life. It ought to impact my life if we have truly done that. So he pleads. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> at, at worst, I guess, and I hate to use the word worst, but in the strongest way, it is a benevolent command, a mild, a gentle command. I'm begging you to do this. This is what God wants you to do. Do is what Paul is saying. So that's, that's the strongest that it might be. Well, what is it that he wants us to do? That we all speak the same thing. Uh, he wants us to be unified. He wants to have a uniformity of testimony. You know, one of the things that is hurting the so-called Christian world today in reference to unbelievers, is that unbelievers look and they see this group teaching this thing and this group teaching that thing and this group teaching another thing. And when they compare all of it, they say, you folks can't even get your own story straight. Why should I follow you? Paul comes along and he says, we need to have a uniformity of testimony. We need to work together, unified for the Lord. And then he goes on and he says that there be no divisions among you. And this means a, a schism, divide, you know, pulled apart as it were. And Paul says that, that shouldn't be there. But in place of that, you ought to be perfectly joined together. And that, that word is a, a very a powerful word. It describes what happens, you know, when the doctor, have you ever broken a bone, maybe your arm, and the doctor takes x-rays and he said, well, you see here, it's broken right here. Uh, we're going to have to put that in a cast or whatever it is that they choose to do in your case. And it's going to stay there for a while. When we get finished with this, uh, then we'll take more x-rays and we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> so they put the cast on. You leave it on for, what, about six weeks, something like that. At the end of six weeks, they x-ray the arm again. And if everything worked out like they expected it to, you'll find that the bone is now uh, totally rejoined. They even tell me that the spot that was broken is stronger now than any of the bone around it uh, because of this healing process that's gone on. Well, Paul says, give up these divisions and, and be brought together, be mended like a broken bone with one another, and how are they going to do this? How are they going to be mended? He says, uh, in the same mind and in the same judgment. And one of the best uh, 
definitions that I found of these two words uh, was that mind describes principles that we understand with our mind. And then judgment is the application of those principles. Everybody at Corinth, in fact, everybody in every church, because remember, if you go back all the way back to verse 2, he talks about Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours, which means that this letter is not just for people of the first century. It applies to us, too. He's our Lord as well. And so to us, what does he say? You need to recognize the principles with your mind and you need to apply them in your life. And there needs to be, as it were, a union, a unity of action on our part. We ought to be distinct because of that unity. Then he explains how he got there. Why did he go there in the first place? Well, now we begin to know. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, the household of Chloe. Likely, this would be the servants in Chloe's house. Now, knowing that both slave and free obeyed the gospel in the first century, it's not really surprising that Paul, uh, if, when he came in contact with uh, these servants from the household of Chloe, they would be asking about the church because they would be a part of it. They would know about the church. And so he inquires of them and they report that there are contentions. And that we probably would put the word quarrels there. You can, you can think of a pretty strong argument going on uh, between the members of the church. And remember now, he wants us to be united in principle and in application. And when, if we're all around quarreling with each other, if the world knows, oh, that church, was, oh, you don't want to go there. They're always wrangling and quarreling and fighting with one another about something. Well, it drives people away. And it's not really a, an accurate display of our Lord and the unity that we ought to be able to find in Him. And so Paul is underscoring that uh, <clears throat> as he begins going into this discussion. So in verse 12 he says, uh, Now this I say, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Just how broken up are they? Just how torn apart are they? Well, I'll tell you how torn apart they are. They are following at least four different men. And we will plan to talk more about that in the future. But for now, realize that Paul wants for this church belonging to God at Corinth, he wants for them God's unmerited favor and a peace that the world just doesn't understand. In the depths of His love And covers me there with His hand And covers me there with His hand